Right, everyone? Are we all ready to start again? Okay, I hope you've all nice and refreshed now. Uh, we're going to be uh, starting our second uh, panel now on blasphemy, Islamophobia, and freedom of thought and expression. Uh, the chair is Victoria Guggenheim, uh, who's an award-winning body artist. Her art ranges from body painting, makeup, photography, sculpture, all these different mediums. Um, she uses body painting, though, as a way of empowering the human spirit, uh, giving the person painted a newfound confidence that she believes can be life-changing. Uh, you'll have the opportunity to see her artwork and even take part in it uh, later on. Uh, but for now, I'll hand over to Victoria. Thank you. Can everybody hear me okay, or do I need to speak from the diaphragm? Are we good? Um, so, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the plenary panel on blasphemy, Islamophobia, freedom of thought and expression. Uh, my name is Victoria Guggenheim. Um, I'm also an activist who uses science and free thought as the basis of all of my work, so I hope I'm at least a little bit qualified to be your chair this afternoon. Um, as we only have 45 minutes of discussion before we take questions, I'll be introducing the speakers briefly. Um, if you want any more information, please refer to your delegate packs. Um, so if you've not asked questions before, I actively encourage you to do so because this is about engaging in dialogue and actually really having a good discussion about this stuff. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce our distinguished speakers. So uh, firstly, uh, a man who needs precious little introduction, um, award-winning author and scientist, writer of The Selfish Gene, Climbing Mountain Probable, The God Delusion, and arguably the founder of the contemporary atheist movement itself. Please give a warm welcome to Professor Richard Dawkins. And following on, we have philosopher extraordinaire, the author of The God Argument, Friendship, The Challenge of Things in the Age of Genius, and frequent contributor to the Index on Censorship and Master of the New College of Humanities. Please welcome A.C. Grayling. Okay. And thirdly, we have president of Warwick University, atheist, secularists, and humanists, a published poet, editor-in-chief of Canartus News, and contributor to the Huffington Post and a philosophy academic. Please welcome Benjamin David. So, and next, we have the CEO of Index on Censorship, previous head of communications for CAMFED, who's previously worked for over a decade as both a foreign correspondent and business journalist. Please welcome Jody Ginsberg. And next, we have a Lebanese civil rights activist and one of the co-founders of Free Thought Lebanon, an initiative designed to promote humanism, encourage critical thinking, and disseminate secular values as a solution for intolerance and sectarian violence and aiding the fight for civil marriage in Lebanon. So please welcome Mazen Abu Hamdan. And last but certainly not least, we have American activist, writer, and speaker, the co-founder of Ex-Muslims of North America, where she advocates the acceptance of religious dissent and works to create local support communities for those who have left Islam, as well as being especially passionate about civil liberties and women's rights. Please give a very warm welcome to Sarah Hader. So I have multiple prepared questions. We may not get through all of these. Um, but the aim, again, really is to have constructive dialogue. So um, first, as an icebreaker, I'd like to ask each of you uh, why you do what you do and why you feel so passionate about it, especially in relation to freedom of thought and expression. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. Uh, I come from Lebanon, and I was born one year after the Civil War ended. For those who don't know, we had a civil war that uh, lasted around 15 years between the years of 75 and 90. And it was fought basically between different religious groups. So we have 18 of them in Lebanon. It's a small country of 4 million people, but we have 18 uh, official religious groups. So after the war ended, we ended up having a power sharing system in our uh, country. So basically, suppose the, uh, the government has 24 ministers, half of them have to be Muslim, half to be half to Christian, and even among each group, they have to be divided Catholics, Orthodox, so on. So basically what this did is that we never really made peace in the country, we just sort of like uh, went to denial and went forward. And what happened is we arrived at a very complex uh, 
system right now. So instead of having one dictator, we have seven dictators. And basically, it's very hard to uh, criticize any minister. So I was just giving an example earlier in the break. Supposing our minister of finance is, uh, is Sunni uh, and he's corrupt, it's hard to actually criticize him because then it would be uh, seen as an attack on the Sunnis in the country. So basically, our system of power sharing under what's so-called stability is actually, uh, it actually nourishes uh, corruption. So I lived in a country where people uh, distrusted each other, there was fear, there was hatred, and it wasn't really addressed. And uh, basically, uh, that pre-post-conflict status encouraged us to think freely, and uh, we found, uh, as any critical thinker would, would find eventually, that secularism is really the way to go. It's, it's the only way to uh, protect rights, to build genuine trust between groups. So it's actually a bit ironic that even as, uh, as atheists right now, we play more of a bridge-building role in our communities between different religions. It's kind of ironic. And uh, so that's Lebanon. Uh, I also like to add one more thing about the Middle East in general, since I have I've had the privilege and uh, honor to be born and raised in the Middle East. So right now, what's uh, I think the struggle facing us in the Middle East is a little bit different than what you're going through in Europe. Uh, basically, we have two main enemies that are trying to suffocate secularism, free speech, and human rights in the Middle East. One of them is indeed Islamic fundamentalism, Sunni Shia, and all that. The other that's just as bad is actually military dictatorships, and we have tons of those. So what's happening right now is that each of these two big evils is trying to promote itself as the solution against the evils of the other party. So basically, we have uh, military regimes suppressing freedom of speech because they're trying to fight Islamists, or so they say, and Islamists, they're trying to gain support because they're trying to fight the injustice of the military. So in all that, people are genuinely fed up with both alternatives. And at this point in the Middle East, I truly believe we are at a crossroads and there is a growing secular movement and people are actually ready to listen to the alternative of secularism. One of the uh, frustrations we feel as uh, free thinkers in the Middle East is that the West um, claims to protect stability in the Middle East. Uh, what this means and effectively is that they're either supporting regimes like KSA uh, or uh, regimes like Egypt or Syria, and, and both are bad, both represent the two evils we're trying to fight. So I think this is either short-sighted from the Western foreign policies, or it's malicious, if you can say. And we really can, uh, the only way to actually achieve human rights, secularism, and freedom of speech in the Middle East is to actually uh, push forward the human rights agenda. So basically, we hope that the, the West would invest more in secularist Middle, uh, Middle Eastern initiatives because now is really the time for it. And we really hope your governments would push our governments more to respect human rights and don't stress too much about what's so-called stability because it's really just delaying the problem from exploding. Thank you. Jody. Um, good afternoon. So I do what I do, and I'm going to keep this um, short because I'm really keen that we get uh, some debate and some discussion happening because that's what I think is most important and most interesting. I do what I do because I think freedom of expression is the most important freedom, the fundamental freedom, and the one on which all others are based. Without it, we can't fight for all our other rights because we can't express ourselves if we're... Thank you. <laughs> Excellent. It's good to be amongst friends. Um, and we are losing that sense of its importance, I think. And what I see in the work that I do is a pincer movement, as has been described. Governments cracking down on freedom of expression in the name of security, national security. Um, fundamentalist groups denying freedom of expression, uh, freedom of religion and society becoming increasingly tolerant, intolerant of differing views um, and being quick to find offence when you disagree with someone. And therefore, I think it becomes increasingly important that we uh, have events like this and we have more discussion about these issues. Thank you. Well, I, I'm passionate about it because I think it matters so, so much. 
you look across the landscape of history, you see that in all those times and places where people were able to think freely and to express themselves, to debate, to discuss, to share ideas, there's been genuine progress. And in all those places and times in history where people were shut up because of the imposition of an orthodoxy, because they weren't allowed to say anything that was out of line with some deep tradition, if they ever challenged or impugned the authority of people who thought they had the truth and a monopoly of the truth, what we saw was stasis and oppression. And if you think about what it would be like to live under that, and those of us who were brought up in the West have very little appreciation from the inside, the inner perspective of so many others of us here today and people we saw on that movie this morning, living under an oppressive regime, unable to express themselves, to discover, to make contact with others, to learn about their ideas, well, one would burst, one would, one would be in an agony of mind at, at being closed off, at being caged. And so everybody, I think every human being, conscious of the fact that what it is to be human and what the possibilities are for our human societies so crucially depends upon being free, that this matter, I mean free in, in thought and in expression as well as in other ways, that this matter of trying to break the chains of tradition and all those oppressive systems of thought that tell people to shut up, just believe, just obey, is probably one of the most important things that we can commit ourselves to in our lives. Well, as a scientist, I care passionately about what's true. And one of the things I notice is that one of the chief oppositions to people talking about what's true comes from religious faith. Uh, in the case of science, I care about it being about it, science because it is so wonderful, so beautiful, uh, so elegant, and for children especially to be denied the experience of understanding the world in which they live, why they exist, uh, is, is a horrible deprivation it, and is positively evil. It is um, child abuse in the case of children. Uh, as it happens, I have a somewhat more personal reason for uh, talking about free speech today, as I've just received the following letter. Uh, it says, Dear Richard Dawkins, event ticket buyer, we regret to inform you that KPFA, KPFA is a radio station in Berkeley, California, which I remember from years back as being a sort of bastion of decent liberalism. We regret to inform you that KPFA has cancelled our event with Richard Dawkins. We had booked this event based entirely on his excellent new book on science. Well, thank you for that, anyway. <laughs> when we didn't know he had offended and hurt in his tweets and other comments on Islam so many people. KPFA does not endorse hurtful speech. While KPFA emphatically supports serious free speech, we do not support abusive speech. Pause for hollow laughter. <laughs> we apologize for not having had broader knowledge of Dawkins' views much earlier. We also apologize to all those inconvenienced by this cancellation. Your ticket purchases will automatically be refunded. Uh, well, of course I value free speech, and I don't, but I actually <laughs> rather resent it being implied that I used abusive speech. Um, I think I'm always really rather polite. Uh, somebody on the web this morning actually um, really went to town trying to find something abusive that I would said about Islam, and he came up with four possibilities as follows. I, I've apparently written the following, which I, I did. One, suggest always put Islamic scholar in quotes to avoid insulting true scholars. <laughs> true scholars have read more than one book. <laughs> <clears throat> well, that's just a joke. I could hardly call that abusive. Two, all the world's Muslims have fewer Nobel Prizes than Trinity College, Cambridge. They did great things in the Middle Ages, though. Well, 
That may be hurtful, but it is actually a matter of sober fact. <laughs> Three, of course you can have an opinion about Islam without having read the Quran. You don't have to read Mein Kampf to have an opinion about Nazism. That's a logical point. I had been accused of being unqualified to offer an opinion on Islam because I had never read the Quran all the way through. So my point was simply we all of us have an opinion about Nazism and most of us haven't actually read Mein Kampf. Uh, you can have an opinion on Islam for all sorts of reasons, such as, for example, the film which we saw this morning, this horrifying, blood-curdling film we saw this morning. Four, it's been suggested that if Mohammed were alive today, he would be a member of ISIS. Interesting to hear Islamic scholars take on this. Well, that is an, an, an offer of a, a discussion, a point, a point for uh, discussion. If any of those is abusive, to paraphrase Ian Hislop, I'm a banana. Um, I wrote a letter to KPFA, which they have not replied to, which I'd like to read to you. Dear KPFA, I used to love your station when I lived in Berkeley for two years, shortly after that beloved place had become the iconic home of free speech. That's referring to the free speech movement which made Berkeley famous in 1963. I listened to KPFA almost every day during those years, and I regularly contributed to your fundraising drives, grateful for your objective reporting and humane commentary while I participated in the People's Park and Vietnam War demonstrations. It was therefore a matter of personal sorrow to me to receive this morning your truly astonishing justification for deplatforming me. It was a personal sorrow. On the other hand, I also think it is a badge of honor. I am proud to be deplatformed by those ridiculous people. <laughs> My memory of KPFA is that you were unusually scrupulous about fact checking. I especially admired your habit of always quoting sources. You conspicuously did not quote a source when, you, when accusing me of abusive speech. Why didn't you check your facts, or at least have the common courtesy to alert me before summarily cancelling my event? If you had consulted me, or if you had done even rudimentary fact-checking, you would have concluded that I have never used abusive speech against Islam. I have called Islamism vile, but surely you of all people understand that Islamism is not the same as Islam. I have criticized the ridiculous pseudo-scientific claims made by Islamic apologists, the sun sets in a marsh, etc. I could have added, Mohammed rode a winged horse, mm. or indeed belief in hell. And the opposition of Islamic, quote, scholars to evolution and other scientific truths. I have criticized the appalling misogyny and homophobia of Islam. I have criticized the murdering of apostates for no crime other than their disbelief. Far from attacking Muslims, I understand, perhaps as you do not, that Muslims themselves are the prime victims of the oppressive cruelties of Islamism, especially Muslim women. I am known as a frequent critic of Christianity and have never been deplatformed for that. Why do you give Islam a free pass? Why is it fine to criticize Christianity but not Islam? I would interject here um, Majid Nawaz's excellent um, comment about the, the racism of lowered expectations. These liberals like K KPFA, who are militantly and correctly feminist and, and homophilic uh, in, the, in their own country, as soon as it's somebody with a brown skin who, who is misogynistic or homophobic, you give them a free pass. That is the the, the racism of lowered expectations. You can't expect those people to have the same standards as we do. What a patronizing, condescending thing to say. Mm. You say I use abusive speech about Islam. I would seriously, I mean it, like to hear what examples of my abusive speech you had in mind. When you fail to discover any, I presume you will issue a public apology, which I will of course accept in a spirit of gratitude for what KPFA once was and could become again.
I'll stop there. On to you, Sarah. Uh, well, my name is uh, Sarah Hader. Uh, I work with ex-Muslims of North America, and to those of you who may not be familiar with the organization, I'll tell you a little bit. Um, we are a, an organization of apostates. We operate in the United States and in Canada, and the heart of what we do is build communities for ex-Muslims. And I think uh, many of you are probably really aware of the challenges of being an apostate, the challenges of being an ex-Muslim, even in the West, um, and particularly the, the social ostracism that can happen when there, are, when there are people that are dissenting from within Muslim communities. So our, um, our, our view on how to create change is that communities are extremely important, that they are the grassroots, they are going to be the heart of what will make change happen. And I've seen this happen as we've built communities across um, the, across North America. I've seen people who you know, were not open, were not out to their family members who were completely in the closet about their lack of faith. And as they made friends, as they met others like themselves, they gained a sense of confidence. And they realized that they, you know, they, weren't, they weren't that crazy and it wasn't so wrong for them to demand uh, that they, their, their freedom and their, their ability to decide who they are be respected. And so I've seen many activists sort of spout up from these communities, and I'm so encouraged to see this happen, and I hope that um, we can do something to increase this and create communities like this all across the world. Um, particularly uh, due to my activism, I've begun to care a lot about civil liberties, and in particular, uh, the freedom of speech. There is this, this wonderful grand idea that you know, it's relatively recent that we should not only tolerate speech that we find offensive, but that there is a benefit um, to society to, to hear these offensive opinions. And this is such a unique idea, and it is such an important idea. And you can see how it relates to progress within the society as a whole, and you can see countries and communities all across the world where this idea is not adopted at all, this, accept, this principle is not accepted, and you can see the reflection on human rights and the way that people are treated. I believe that particularly because this idea is counterintuitive, um, I think our intuitions want us to do something when we are offended. Our intuitions want us to take some action to, to get our sense of dignity back and to do it in, a, in an active way. That's our intuition. And I think that because this idea of tolerating um, offense is so counterintuitive, it needs champions. And I hope that if there's something that people will take from this conference, from these two days, is that you know, we need champions and it needs to be people in this room who are able to do it, who are able to speak out, and I hope you'll take that chance. And finally, Benjamin. Yeah, um, I first want to just thank um, Miriam Namazi and the Council of Ex-Muslims of Britain for inviting me and really for you know, fostering an amazing conference. Um, so I am the editor-in-chief of Canadian News and most people here will have known about the, the website by either being interviewed by it or for writing for it. And um, I just want to give a succinct delineation about what Canadian News is. So, um, unlike typical online journalism, Canadian News revolutionizes the fundamental ethos of news media by placing a considerable investment in publishing narratives which accord with our commitment to social, progressivism, to social progression. We have a team of around 100 writers, including um, editors and board members, and we've published around 800 articles. So, we at Canadian News believe that Identities have become prioritized over ideas, sales over social progression, and online journalism has become awash with partisan cursory narratives. Now, we know from even with Richard Dawkins' email that the claim of Islamophobia is rife. And it's important for Canadian News to really give a, a liberal, free speech argument for either reforming Islam or empowering 
ex-Muslims. And that is why we decided to call our platform Canados News. For those people who know Latin here, Canados means drive. And from my years of working in activism, I've met so many wonderful people who had a drive to talk about their experiences, whether it be being victims of FGM, being shunned, being abused and worse. So Canadian News is about providing a platform for the voiceless, those who've gone to big news organizations talk about being shunned, being attacked, who weren't given a platform. So we're all volunteers who've come together to say enough is enough and we will do all that we can to give the most persecuted minority a voice. That is what it really means to be a left. Fantastic. And uh, I think in light of that, we're going to jump into a relatively juicy question. So um, I'm thinking in reference to kind of Popper's paradox of intolerance, how can we better manage and minimize intolerance while also protecting free speech? And how can this be kind of contextually applied to us? Um, so, yeah, I'd actually like to start with uh, Jody for this one. Um, well, I think the, the jumping off point is probably to talk about Richard's letter in a little bit more detail. Um, I think what we notice increasingly, particularly amongst um, the liberal community, is this sense that in order to protect uh, minorities and certain groups, we have to um, curb the speech of other people. You know, so Richard is considered to be offensive in the eyes of, of KPFA to some Muslims, therefore the solution to that is to silence Richard. Uh, similarly, we see that in all sorts of avenues that supposedly in the name of defending and supporting minorities and, and other groups, that, that the solution that's, that's reached for very quickly is to silence those who are critical of them um, in a, as, a, as a form of protection. And I think that's a really, really dangerous route that we're going down. I understand the impulse. I understand the impulse that says women, for example, not a minority group, uh, being shut down on Twitter, for example, because they're getting slews of critical um, tweets, uh, derogatory remarks. Therefore, the solution is to stop those people speaking out because that will somehow elevate the speech of those women. I, I simply don't see that as the solution. It can't be the solution. What we have to do is encourage more speech from those uh, groups from those uh, individuals. We have to find ways, you know, if you have a problem with a certain speaker getting a platform, for example, make sure that you're giving platforms to those people who, whose, whose voices are being suppressed. Don't start from the point that you're going to suppress everybody else's voice. It's a kind of totally counterintuitive methodology. So I think it's perfectly possible to promote tolerance, as um, Professor Grayling said, by, through the promotion of debate, not, by through, not, not through the suppression of voices. Yes, uh, um, the, the, the um, key here really is that it's so easy to offend and hurt people who are really ready to take offense and, to, and claim to be hurt, whether or not what you said is genuinely abusive. After all, in the instant case, um, we're talking about people who are offended and uh, hurt because uh, somebody has said something true. And of course, you know, that, that, that situation is exactly our, our problem where we want to say, look, evolutionary um, bi biology or uh, a description of the world in cosmological terms of being 13.5 billion years old rather than 6,000 years old. Those sorts of remarks are just remarks from, from best theory and the closest we get to, uh, to, to the truth in, in science. They're going to offend and hurt people who want to see things differently and a different way. So th the question we have to ask ourselves is this. Are there forms of speech which, uh, which could cause hurt, but in addition to causing hurt, also introduce genuine discrimination? This is why we have uh, legislation, and I think justifiedly so, 
uh, against um, the kind of hate speech directed at people who might have a disability or against people because of their age or their gender or their sexual orientation. But the fact that religion has been included among those things has been a, an extremely bad mistake. A very bad mistake because ideas, we all know this, don't have rights. Beliefs don't have rights. People do. It's people who should be protected in certain defined cases from the kind of, of speech that might produce discrimination against them. But in all other cases, the fact that somebody is offended or hurt by what somebody says or by a viewpoint that they put forward should be neither here nor there. You should say to such people, grow up, be robust, and always remember the following principle because this has to be the underlying principle. When there is free speech that some people regard as bad free speech, the answer to it is better free speech. Argue back, make a better case back. That's the way to deal with it. Not to say my sensibilities have been hurt and therefore you have to shut up. Marzen, would you like to chime in? Well, um, definitely there is a big difference between Europe and the Middle East. Like you, you guys here are discussing uh, how would you deal with the intolerant, among the tolerant, open society. In my country, it's the opposite way around. So uh, the country is intolerant overall. The system is intolerant, and we are the few voices calling for tolerance. So uh, I definitely support you in your battle. But I, I feel jealous, honestly, because you know, we still have a long way to go. Um, I guess I'd like just to add one last idea uh, in this topic. I think there, there's definitely a big link between the struggle in Europe and the Middle East. So basically, uh, all the mess that you're dealing with right now, in some way or another, had uh, its roots in, in the Middle East. Uh, and all these ideologies of, of hate, of discrimination, of close-mindedness, um, they owe their heritage to basically what, what happened historically in the Middle East. So. Uh, it's been going on for maybe a hundred years, even like back in the um, Abdel Nasser days in Egypt, a military uh, so-called progressive leader who, who chose to shun the Muslim Brotherhood and deny them the opportunity to participate in politics. And basically that movement later gave birth to Qaeda because they felt that they are marginalized, that the army is doing uh, torture and prisons, all that, so they gained legitimacy and then eventually they came to power, and then after that, the army took that power back. So basically, it's, it's been an ongoing uh, tug of war between dictatorships and fundamentalists. And at some point, we need to break that cycle. And I think that uh, like actually realizing actual rights, actual political participation, actual uh, freedom of speech in the Middle East would definitely reflect positively on Europe. Fantastic. So Richard, would you like to chime in? Yes, I, I, I feel deeply about the plight of people who have come out to their parents as atheists and apostates, um, especially, obviously, in the Islamic world where the penalties are so much more severe, but it applies also in, in the Western world as well. Um, in the film that we saw, I think more than one person said that they felt shunned not just because they had apparently betrayed their heritage, but they were treated as stupid. Well, if you're in that position and your parents tell you that you're stupid, you're not the stupid one, they are. You should be proud of having shaken off a medieval superstition. Uh, you are the ones who are clever, you are the ones who, who, have, um, who have earned the right to respect in the world. So don't let anybody call you stupid for giving up your religion. People who believe in a winged horse or believe in hell, they're the stupid ones. There's also a, a, a problem in the West with the, what's been what Majid Nawaz has called the, re, the regressive left. Um, this, this doesn't help matters. It doesn't help matters that, that people who ought to be on your side are actually your enemies. And I would like to suggest that this conference should draft some kind of a message to Western liberals saying, stop giving Islam a free pass. Treat Islam the <laughs> They are very happy about bad-mouthing Christianity, but as soon as it comes to Islam, then, then the, 
the, the, the rules of the game completely change. You notice this in Twitter. If you, if you say something about um, FGM and this appalling practice, using a rusty razor blade to cut off the, the parts of a woman that are going to give her sexual joy, um, you get a flood of replies, what about male circumcision? Well, yes, it's not a good thing to do things to babies when they can't consent, but there really isn't a fair comparison there. It's, it simply distracts from the, uh, from the horror of female genital mutilation. And similarly, uh, you constantly get, whenever you say anything about the appalling things that are done in the name of Islam, um, well, you have to blame the West for invading Iraq or whatever it is. Of course, that was a terrible thing to do, but you cannot blame the, w the West for most of what's going on in the name of Islam or Islamism. Um, there are offense junkies out there who just love being offended. They can't get enough of it. And I think this is partly fed by a kind of dogma that is spread throughout Actually, even the academic world, at least in the humanities, the idea that feelings are what really matter. It doesn't matter what's true, it doesn't matter what's objectively true, it doesn't matter what there's evidence for, but how do you feel about it? <laughs> well, I don't give a damn how you feel about it. I, <laughs> I care about what's true. <laughs> okay, I'll stop there. <laughs> Sarah. Uh, well, I mean, I think that that could almost be the last word, but I'll add a little bit more um, to just follow up on what was said earlier. Um, causing hurt can s simply can't be the standard of what we consider acceptable or not acceptable speech. It simply cannot be. It's not something that is reliable. It's not something that we can trust to, to guide us on, on the right path. Um, but as far as things that we can do to, to discourage censorship, certainly we can work to eradicate blasphemy laws all over the world. We can... <laughs> and we can work to educate people on the importance of free speech. Um, I, many of you are probably uh, educated on what's going on in college campuses um, all across the world, really, all across the Western world, but particularly in the United States, there has been so many controversies with students in particular um, being anti-free speech. They seem to feel that it's a tool of the oppressor, and they really seem to misunderstand that this is the only tool that the truly oppressed have. And so what we can start with is educating um, our youth and making sure that they understand why this is something that needs to be championed. Finally, Benjamin. Well, it's important for us to be aware of one of the biggest perpetrators of free speech contraventions, that is, accusations of Islamophobia. And let's be under no illusion that this problem is going to augment it's gonna get worse and worse and worse. But the question is, what is Islamophobia? Well, I had this succinct definition. It's a word created by fascists and used by cowards to manipulate morons. <laughs> so I just want to just very briefly talk about what it is, and then hopefully we can unpack the discussion more. So, Islamophobia, the way it's found manifestation and holds steady in politics and the media, is one that conflates an ideology with a people. In other words, Islamophobia today principally means an animus towards a people, Muslims. But how did Islamophobia become such an ubiquitous term in politics and in the media? Firstly, the term could never have achieved such world popularity without, to quote the former editor-in-chief of Charlie Hebdo, who was butchered by Islamist terrorists in January 2015, the mostly idiotic complicity of the media. But why? As Charlie Hebdo themselves recognized, because of laziness, then for novelty, and lastly, out of commercial interest. However, importunate as the media has been in fetishizing the word, we must not overlook identity politics. Why? Well, put simply, cultures 
have become synonymous with the category of the ethnic, the category of the minority. Culture has become seen as an entity highly abstracted from practices of daily life, thereby becoming represented as a spirit of the people. Culture has become a homogenization of cultural identity and the ascription of particular values onto minority cultural groups. In effect, what this means is that Islamophobia has become the new racism. Yesterday's anti-racism activist is turning into the salesman of a highly specialized commodity, a niche form of discrimination. But why is this problematic? It's problematic because Islamophobia, being the new racism, is flawed when we realize the obvious fact. Islam is not a race, ethnicity, or nationality. It's a set of ideas. Criticizing these ideas, such as stoning adulterers, crime for apostasy, ideas of paradise and martyrdom, should never be confused nor conflated with an animus toward people. However, it is being done so. I'm certain, like many others here, that it is being done intentionally, strategically, and rather gloomily as a means of shutting down significantly important topics. But we will not be shut down. Absolutely, yes, go ahead. So I just want to add something to this uh, d debate about tolerance. Um, just looking at the demagogues, the Islamist demagogues we saw in the film earlier today, one, one thing you notice about that situation is how hysterical and infantile it is. There's not thought going on there, there is just pure emotion. And the crowds who shout, burn down the houses of atheists and so on, what, what, what's happening is that certain slogans, certain trigger expressions are being used to evoke those mass emotions, those mob emotions. Now, a long time ago, Jonathan Swift said, you cannot reason people out of views that they weren't reasoned into. And the thing about uh, and people who have a very deep and uh, um, sometimes very sincere religious commitment is that very, very, very few of them ac uh, acquired that commitment by you know, picking up the Quran or picking up the Bible, reading it and saying, my word, this is good. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> right. I'm, I'm going to believe this. They, 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 were, they were brainwashed into it as small children. As Richard said, it is really a form of child abuse to load somebody with, with these bars, these chains, very early on so that it's terribly difficult and painful sometimes for the individual himself or herself to break those chains. But they weren't reasoned into it. And therefore, how you get them to appreciate the great importance of tolerance. How, for example, you could get the idea of pluralism, of accepting that people might have different views from your own and that you can live quite comfortably with people uh, if you will agree to differ about some things. To get the concept of pluralism into the uh, Muslim majority world has been said to me by um, Muslim scholars and actually there, there are one or two, they say it's, it's terribly difficult to do it because uh, it it's sounds like and feels like an attack on the purity of the faith and on the very ground on which people stand. So it's a big problem, this one, teaching tolerance to the intolerant. That's uh, an aspect of the paradox that, uh, uh, that, that Victoria raised. How do you do that? Well, ouvrage de longue haleine, as the French say, a work of long breath, and it really does have to start in our education system and pretty early on. And one very key thing to doing that is to get religion out of education. Bravo. Um, so I noticed you were kind of scribbling over here a little. So even though it's 12.45 and we should be opening for questions, if there's any kind of vital closing remarks you have, then um, please state them now. Uh, I'd like to add something uh, go ahead. to some of the comments that were said by Benjamin earlier. He was talking about, you know, why Islamophobia in particular is such a is such a devastating concept and how it paralyzes intellectual discourse. Um, what I'd like to add to that is that it's it's extremely racist 
right? I mean, to assume that Muslims are in some way tied down to, Muslims, the people, are tied down to a set of belief, that it is inherent uh, in them, that it is a quality that they just can't shake off. But being Muslim is a choice, and it is a choice that Dep whether or not they were brainwashed into it or, or just converted into it, it's a choice that they make every day. And it is a choice they can choose not to make. And we can persuade them out of that choice. So I, I think we need to walk away from this term, particularly because it denies this idea that Muslims have a freedom to choose. It denies their autonomy, and in that way, it dehumanizes them um, because it denies that they are thinking people, that they are rational people. Absolutely right. And, uh, agreed, agreed. Could I add to that? And, and just an, as a sort of illustration of that, <clears throat> you often see dire demographic predictions that by the year 2050, I don't know, France will be overwhelmingly Muslim or something of that sort. Those kinds of predictions are based upon the assumption that every baby born to Muslim parents will, will grow up a Muslim. I mean, what a patronizing thing to assume, that, they're, that they're, they're simply incapable of changing their minds. We've got to help people change their minds. That's what education is, is, is about. The assumption that a child will necessarily inherit the religion of their parents is, well, again, that is a form of child abuse. It's a thing we all do, whether we're actually atheists or not. We all accept the language. We talk, talk about a Catholic child, a Protestant child, a Muslim child. That should sound like fingers grating on a blackboard when you hear a phrase like Catholic child or Muslim child. There's no such thing as a Catholic child, no such thing as a Muslim child. There are ch children of Muslim parents, and with any luck, they'll change their minds. So I just, I just wanted to pick up um, something that Anthony and Sarah alluded to, and I thought this was a really interesting comment, that when things feel sort of counterintuitive, our, our instinct is to do something. And I think that do something has really worrying consequences often, in, because what do something often means for legislators is make more law. And what we've seen increasingly in the name of protecting minority groups and you know, notionally promoting tolerance is increasing numbers of laws dealing with speech specifically. And I think they're hugely problematic. I don't disagree that we need laws to protect people from discrimination. What I don't think is we need laws to protect people from speech. Um, and yet, in order to notionally protect groups, increasingly we're seeing ever widening definitions around hate speech, uh, there's some talk that perhaps you know, we might want to include border hate speech laws to include misogyny, for example. Our belief, or my belief, is that we shouldn't have hate speech laws actually at all. I, I, I don't think that they serve any purpose whatsoever, but they certainly shouldn't be widened any further. And equally, in order to deal with the government's uh, you know, concerns around language that they consider to be extremist, though yet to find a definition of extremist that anyone can agree on, Increasingly, we're looking at potential laws to deal with language that doesn't incite violence in any way, but governments and others consider to be problematic. And that has huge implications, I think, for um, not just religious communities, but secular communities as well, who in many communities, whose views would be considered to be extreme. And we have to push back really, really hard against those encroachments. So if there's no more closing remarks, um, did you want to say something? Just, yeah, just a few words. Yeah. Um, in the morning, uh, Mariam said something that a tsunami is coming in the world. I, I truly believe, that it's, uh, she's, she's right, uh, at least the historical conditions of such a tsunami, they're, they're ripe, they're there. But uh, someone needs to push further. Like just last year uh, in Lebanon was the first uh, every year in the history of my country where we had a LGBT pride week and this was, of course, under Islamic threats. People were in danger, they had to really change it, they had to do it online, but it happened. So uh, I truly believe, like even when Richard said, the FGM issue in, in the Middle East compared to circumcision, uh, the real messy issues are in the Middle East, and um, I believe that the return on investment, if you want to call it that, of uh, supporting activists in the Middle East, like, like the kind of impact you would have, I think is uh, significantly more within the same resources than what you would achieve, let's say, in your own country. I'm raising awareness about circumcision. 
So I, I believe like uh, we, in the Middle East and all the different countries, there are groups of secularists that are dedicated. They're ready, they have an alternative vision. I think the people are ready to hear this vision. And I think uh, we hope at least that the international secularist uh, scene would sort of like uh, support uh, all these momentums. Thank you. Can I just uh, add? That's yeah, of course. Yeah, yes. okay. It's very, very briefly. Um, one, of my, one of my closing remarks is the, just want to highlight the importance of the work being done by progressive Muslims um, alongside ex-Muslims. And they are facing considerable problems, both from the aggressive left and the far right. The far right would never see them as legitimate because they always see Muslims in whatever form as full donning caliphate craving fundamentalists at odds with British values. Then again, on the regressive left, who always see problems through a Western-centric lens with a postmodernistic view of the world, will see that there's nothing wrong within Islam. The problems that happen with terrorism is all because of Western interventionism. There's no need to reform Islam because it's all the West's, all the West's fault. So if we want to empower progressive Muslims alongside ex-Muslims, we need to recognize that we have considerable problems happening from these political fissures. And I can only imagine that they're probably going to get worse and worse over the coming years. Okay, now should we open this up to questions? Thank you so much. So my question briefly is, uh, what are your thoughts on the modern Islamic reform movement advocated by people like Majid Nawaz, Ayn Hirsi Ali, and more recently, Imam Tawhidi? And do you think that trying to reform Islam rather than advocating for its abandonment is giving in to the Islamophobia accusation, accusations and giving in to the PC culture? Well, I can, I can talk about this. <laughs> uh, I deeply support Muslim progressives and uh, people who are attempting to reform the religion from within. Um, they have all my support. I think they're doing you know, a, a, a valuable thing, and I hope they are successful in any way. And whatever I can do to make that happen, I will do. However, uh, I do not think their ideological stance is tenable. And I do not like the idea of ceding any ground at all to religious theocrats. I don't want to argue in favor of women's rights starting from the foundation of the Quran. I don't want to start there because that means... That means I'm already starting from a negative. I've already lost a little bit, and now I have to work harder to catch up, and I have to use the verses of the Quran or practices and traditions from within the, the religion to justify a women's rights. That hampers that's my ability to, to argue for women's rights, my ability to argue for human rights. And it's just, it seems to me that it's something that we wish would happen. I think we all want um, Muslim progressives and Muslim reform movements to work. I certainly do. Um, but I don't know if that's something that's going to be possible. I think that we should put our faith in people who are leaving behind religion altogether or who are just saying, you know what, I, I, don't, really, I don't really care or I don't really, I don't really feel that strongly about it. I think those are the people that we need to put our steam behind and they are growing. Um, a lot of people assume that ex-Muslims are just a tiny, tiny minority and we are, we are small in comparison to the Muslim population overall, but we are growing. There are, we are growing fast and the internet is making it easier for us to encounter literature all across. Um, like I know people who, who have told me, you know, I was in you know, Afghanistan and then I found Richard Dawkins' book and I read it and then it changed the way that I thought about religion. So this is working. People are choosing to abandon their religion even in remote places all across, all across the world. They're willing to do it. And if they can do it there, they can do it here. <coughs> Yes, yes, I must say, I, I did take encouragement from, from what Sarah's just said and from various people who've said, we are growing, we are, we are, we are many. Um, just to give a figure, which I hope is true, and I've been told several times, uh, the God delusion has no official Arabic translation. Mm. There is, however, an unofficial Arabic translation for which I get no royalties, and I'm delighted that it's there anyway. Um, 
The unofficial Arabic translation is available on PDF, and I'm reliably told it has been downloaded 10 million times. <laughs> and, and three million of those downloads in Saudi Arabia. Now, to come to the question about progressive m Muslims, um, I have enormous admiration for both Majid Nawaz and Ayan Hirsi Ali. I'm disgusted by the way they are traduced in social media all the time. Um, I I Ayan has actually been, been deplatformed, I think, probably more than once. She is a hero. She's a courageous woman who has borne a tremendous lot. She, she has to go under permanent bodyguard. She is a real hero to the enlightened world, and I'm disgusted at the way people uh, traduce her and, and treat her. Um, when, I, when I meet, um, well, she of course is not a, not a Muslim at all, um, Majid Nawaz claims to be. When, whenever I meet a, a progressive Muslim who's, as it were, on our side, but says he's a Muslim or she's a Muslim, I always say, but why the hell are you a Muslim? I mean, you're clearly an intelligent person. Um, what's it all about? Why do, why do you believe this nonsense when there's no justification, no evidence for it whatsoever? And usually they kind of smile, and I get the feeling they're actually, they actually don't believe it, but they see it as politically expedient yes. um, to reform from, from within. And I, I get that. I mean, I could imagine that could be a... a um yeah, I mean, I can only concur with the, the, the points. Um, and of course, Ayon is a, is a very well-known um, ex-Muslim, and you have people like Majid Nawaz and, and Harris Afiq and Osama Hassan, and you have people like um, Shreen Kadosi in, in America who are doing fantastic work and who are getting just, you know, death threats and, and, and threats of, you know, threats to their families and such. And, and like Richard Dawkins um, said, you know, I cannot understand um, why they would hold on to very facile beliefs about you know, heaven and, and martyrdom and such, but that's neither here nor there. I'm particularly concerned about what are their actions? What are they trying to do, you know, regardless of the foundation? And what they're trying to do is trying to infuse the religion and the communities with more feminism and progressive values more, more broadly. And that I can only, um, I can only um, compliment. Can I ask a question, please? Yes. Um, over here. Yeah. The lady at the back here? Here, I have a microphone right here no, to your left. Here. Hello. Ask right here. Right here. Oh, Hello. Oh, sorry. I'm so sorry. Okay. I didn't see you. I'm All right. Sorry. Thanks. Hi, my name is Annie Zonnewald. I'm the founder and president of Muslims for Progressive Values, and thank you, Benjamin, for your affirmation of progressive Muslims. I think um, as Muslims for Progressive Values, our position has always been to support freedom of expression, absolute freedom of expression, including hateful ones. And for 10 years, we've always been supporting freedom of religion and belief. That means the right for Muslims to leave Islam, and we support that from the context of the Quran. Sorry, Richard Dawkins. but. So I have a question actually, and I wasn't sure who it was. There was a law that's being passed that includes blasphemy, in, that includes religion, is that correct? Is that in the UK? Sorry? Uh, Somebody said, we, we can't, we quite, we can't wait to understand the acoustic. If, if you could speak slowly, because yes, the acoustic oh, sorry. is quite terrible, sorry. Okay, so um, there is a law Somebody talked about a law that included um, hate speech to include religion. Is that here in the UK? Yes. Okay, thank you. So there has been a, a, a full-on initiative by the Saudi Arabian government on various UN international mechanisms to include religion as part of that. So the, the, the censorship of religion in speech. And so that's been their effort for some years. So what, what I wanted to say is that we've, we've talked about the grassroots initiatives of progressives and ex-Muslims and um, demonization or the stupidity of anyone who believes in a god or the creator or what have you. But the fact is the radicalism, the definition of what Islam is, is been defined by Islamic states. The Islamic states is getting a lot of funding, like Saudi Arabia and Malaysia, by the, <laughs> by the American government, my government. 
So they are pep perpetuating this definition of Islam that harms all anybody that is a free thinker. As a progressive Muslim, I promote free thinking individuals, and I don't care what religion or non-religion you are, it doesn't matter. And so I think there is, it's, it's naive to think that Islam is just, you are actually perpetuating the definition of Islam based on what Saudi Arabia defines, based on what Turkey defines it, or whatever Mala Malaysian government defines it. Progressive Muslims in Malaysia are deemed, uh, my, I did already, but I can also make a statement because I've been listening to this all morning. This is freedom of speech. And so I think we also have to disengage from what is the definition of Islam. My definition of Islam is very different than many other Muslims. So everybody has that right. And so to define it as defined by a state, you're just perpetuating the same nonsense. Um, so I just wanted to clarify something about um, around laws in the UK so that we're just clear. So the law that the government was looking at introducing and seems to have taken slightly off the table at the moment is around um, extremism and create, trying to create uh, new potentially speech laws that could involve banning, for example, certain speakers from speaking if they're considered to be extremists. That's been moved now to a commission that's going to consider these things, but that was on, that was on the table. So not necessarily a definition of religion, but of Indian. extremism, and trying to work out what an extremist is and then work from there. Um, however, obviously in the UK we do have things like race and, religious hate, race and religious hatred laws that prevent people from inciting religious hatred, for example. Um, and in other countries, obviously, we've got much broader hate speech laws that specifically pre prevent people um, offending people on the basis of their religion, for example. But I just wanted to make that clarification about the law that I was talking about. Well, I'll say um, a little bit about that as well. Um, so, like I said, I really support the initiative of, of, of progressives, but um, as Annie mentioned, I think she was talking a little bit about the idea that if we if we um, underst if we understand the, the if we define Islam as something closer to the Saudi version, that we're in we're we're doing a harm to society and to discourse. Um, I will have to I do have to say that. When I'm talking about Islam, I'm talking about what I see as broad patterns in practice, and what I'm seeing when I'm reading the scripture and I'm, and I'm uh, getting the most obvious conclusion from the scripture. And most importantly, I define Islam in the way that people uh, who, who <laughs> practice it are defining Islam. So if the vast majority of Muslims are extremely progressive and they're able to you know, work around the scripture however they want and then they get to a different conclusion, then we're talking about a different religion. But the practice matters. How people are using the, script, uh, the scripture matters. And, and it's important for us to be able to define it, to be able to accurately point at the problem. It is relevant that extremists and conservatives are referencing scripture. They're not referencing anything else. They're looking right back at the scripture. So we have to be able to look at the scripture and say, well, what is wrong here? Hi. So I, have, um, I have a question going back to the uh, issue of regressive left. Um, it's sort of slightly, sort of, I'm thinking out loud, so bear with me for a moment. Um, uh, the thing is that I'm, what I'm seeing is sort of almost like a need for a second front where we, we have the need to push against, in the West, the liberals. And most of the, a lot of people that I know think of themselves as progressive left. And they, are such, they ought to be such natural allies, such natural supporters of these ideas. And I would like to think that they are just misguided and therefore they've taken the position that they take. So the question that I have, and coming, uh, bring the second point to the inspiration that I've taken from the various debates that uh, Professor Dawkins, Grayling, or David Silverman have done with against theists, whether there is a, uh, a need for that kind of conversation because the progressive or regressive left is such a large body of influence potentially if it's possible to bring them over to our ideas and whether anybody has tried and have actually good results i mean we can say all the things that we 
say here, and we all sort of agree, but I have a feeling often we're just talking past each other with them. Okay. So, 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 so I by what you're attempting to say, so are you, are you saying, um, I, I just want to break this down, so you've got the um, progressive and the regressive left, and what you're attempting to say is we should engage in dialogue with one another. With, with them. I, I, I sort of used both words, sort of, it, I'm, I'm mm. saying more, they think of themselves as progressive, but their views on this aspect is often regressive. Right, I see. Okay. Yeah. And I'm seeing that because there's been so much pushback whenever I talk to them, and I don't seem to be able to bring them to this point of view, we just sort of stop like talking about it. I'm thinking whether there's a need for a more of an approach or whether like the Dawkins Foundation might think about doing something more systematic about it. Okay. Because there's such a large group of allies potentially. Thank you. Okay. Well, I, I could return to the suggestion I made earlier that we, we have in this room a large number of people who were brought up Muslims uh, and are in an authoritative position to join together in signing a document which could be um, issued as an appeal to the regress, well, let's say to the, to the, to the liberal left generally in the, in the West, to stop giving Islam a free pass, to treat Islam exactly as though it was any other religion. Um, to, to, to say, look, we, we, are, we know what it's like from the inside. We were, we were Muslims. Some of us still are. Um, and we appeal to you to stop this double standard that you are operating, which is not helping us. Could we, I wonder whether, we, it's, it's not my business because I've never been a Muslim, but uh, there are so many people here who could collaborate together in producing a public appeal to the liberal left in, in the West to come to the support of the gay people in Muslim countries, women in Muslim countries, oppressed people in general in Muslim countries, to come to the support instead of kowtowing to the oppression which is inflicted upon them. I wonder whether, is, is it possible, Mariam, is it possible, is she here to organize something like that? Yes, there is uh, sort of a, um, a declaration has been sort of um, considered for, for the conference as well that include that, the point that you made, yes. Thank you. Good. Yeah. Right. Yes, please. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I think it's really, really important to distinguish between liberal left, progressive left, and regressive left. So the liberal left are people like Majid Nawaz and Charlie Hebdo. Regressive left, by contrast, they eschew liberalism. They hate liberalism. They see liberals, the liberal left, as almost their enemies. The progressive left, by contrast, are people like myself, and I think the majority of people here, people who believe in reason, in the fundamental human rights, and believe in social justice. The regressive left fetishize identity politics, social justice as well, but they do it through a postmodernist view, which means that, you know, when it comes to ex-Muslims, you know, it's, it's all relative. There is no fundamental um, human rights at all. It's all relative. It's all structured. And actually, when, it come, when, you, when they see, um, when they see ex-Muslims or they see terrorist in instances, they try to explain it away by pointing to the West as a structure. And as, as, as Richard Dawkins said, it's the racism of low expectations. It's that Muslims, for example, in the Middle East who commit terrorist incidences on a very daily basis do so because they're devoid of autonomy. It's all because of, of Western interventionism. And so it's, it's very, very difficult to, to pull the, the rest of the left over onto our side because what it means is it's really changing their worldview. And whether that can be done or not, is, you know, I, I, I don't know. But I can certainly say that the progressive left and the liberal left really are on our side, not the regressive left, though. I'd just like to say something about the idea of progressive or moderate forms of any religion. Um, uh, uh, about, uh, ooh, near, getting on for about 15 or more years ago, uh, a mutual friend of Richard's and mine, Sam Harris, published a book in which he pointed out that moderate forms of religion serve as a kind of mask, in a way, for what can lie 
beyond them, which are the more radical, the more fundamentalist, the more harmful forms of those religions. So the very nice people who go to church every Sunday here uh, in the UK um, uh, and have a, a very tolerant, very moderate kind of outlook and don't force their religious views on other people, keep pretty well to themselves. Uh, they, they are uh, I I inadvertently, uh, perhaps don't realize that they are, but a kind of front for people who really read the scriptures and take them seriously and believe them literally and then act on them. And let's not forget, it wasn't just in medieval times, in sort of late medieval times, that uh, the Christian religion was as coercive and murderous as uh, some relig other religions are today. Because there are fundamentalist Christians today who quite cheerfully murder a, 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 you know, a, a, an abortion doctor in a clinic in the southern <coughs> states of America. So this point has to be remembered that moderate and progressive forms of religion are those forms of religion which cherry pick their tradition and their documents. I mean, if you were really, really serious as a, as a Christian and you really wanted to believe everything that was written in the Old and New Testaments, you would be busy stoning us all now because we're not a church on the Sabbath, this being the Sabbath, okay? Uh, or um, homosexuals or, or whatever. And the fact that they don't do that means that they've taken the little bits that they can live with and that they like and that's okay and they've neglected all the others. That's what it is to be a, a moderate Christian is, in fact, to be a hypocrite. Now, I'm being rather tough on them, but I'm afraid it just that's what it comes down to. Mm -hmm. So when one asks for progressive or, or moderate forms of, of uh, religion, one has to remember that anybody who is very genuinely committed to believing the fundamental tenets of their faith and the fundamental doctrines of, of their uh, faith um, could turn out to be very problematic to their neighbors if their neighbors don't share their view. And so we have to be a little bit careful on this question of, of um, accepting um, the idea that it would be better to stop short in the argument to try to make the world as a whole a secular domain where everybody can live with everybody else and won't impose their views or persecute other people because they don't share those views. In, in seeking for that, one wants to make pretty sure that that's what people mean when they talk about being progressive or moderate. Can I just... And I, <coughs> I just wanted to add something to this debate about progress, uh, progressive left, or whatever you call them, and I'm not sure all of these definitions are, are massively useful, but what I do think is we cannot let um, these um, values like freedom of expression be seen as something espoused simply by right-wingers, for example. Um, in the US in particular, Sarah's already alluded to what's happening in universities, increasingly what we're seeing is free speech activists being kind of considered one and another piece with right-wing activists. So the only people who are speaking out and up volubly for free expression also happen to be right-wing white males. That's hugely problematic. We need to get better. We need to get better at being really strong advocates for free expression amongst those people who don't necessarily fall into the right-wing male category because it's not something that only benefits right-wing white males. But at the moment, those are being seen as their greatest advocates and therefore it's becoming seen increasingly, I think, by the general public as something that belongs only to the right, only belongs to the powerful. And we've got to get better, I think, at being really powerful voices against that dogma. Here, here. Yeah. So I th Next question. I, I have the microphone. I'm not sure if okay, it's. So is it, I think I'm the yeah. next person actually. Yeah. This is like two. Um, like what so I wanted. Okay. To, yeah, my name is Karima Benoun, and I wanted to say something quickly and then ask a question. I'm, I'm terribly sorry. Could you please speak up? Yes. Thank uh, you. Sorry. Is that better? <laughs> so my name is Karima Benoun. I wanted to make a quick comment and then ask a question. Sure. Um, it seems to me that if we are serious about finding strategies that will be effective to challenge human rights abuses committed in the name of religion, as well as to challenge religious fundamentalisms, uh, which is my focus, uh, we will have to build a coalition 
of religious believers who respect human rights, non-believers, atheists, agnostics, and everybody across the free thinking spectrum. And it seems to me that it's quite difficult uh, to really achieve that coalition if we speak in very disrespectful ways about other people's beliefs. We have the right to do that, absolutely, and I defend that right. But I think strategically, just as it would be problematic uh, for religious believers to denounce <coughs> in blanket terms the beliefs of atheists, and I would challenge that as well. I think we need to think, uh, as we were told this morning, about a secular language uh, that is more inclusive. So please take that as a friendly comment. Uh, you may not see it that way, but that's the way it's meant. And then my question is this. I think what you're saying about the misuse of the concept of Islamophobia, which is a very problematic concept that links together discrimination against uh, Muslims or people assumed to be Muslim uh, and critique of Islam, uh, I agree with that critique of the concept of Islamophobia. And at the same time, we are seeing uh, across the West the rise of really virulent discrimination, not only against Muslims, but anyone sort of assumed to be Muslim, uh, immigrants, and so on. How do we find the multi-directional strategies for challenging the misuse of the concept of Islamophobia and standing up at the same time uh, to the far right and its extremist agenda against Muslims, immigrants, and others? Thanks a lot. Do you want to say this, anyone? Well, uh, no, I, I think the, the answer to, to your question has been mentioned several times. Um, is to eschew and to, and to object very strongly to prejudice against individual people, but not ideas. Ideas are, are up, for, up for argument, and so criticize religion as much as you like um, and hurt people's feelings if, you, if that does so, but don't insult them as individuals. <clears throat> don't discriminate against them as individuals. Don't try to stop them coming into your country like President, in quotes, Trump. Uh, <laughs> trying to do in that outrageous um, attempt. Now, on to, on to before your question, your, your point about um, building a coalition and, and respecting re religious people and trying to get them into the coalition. There, there's a lot in that, of course, but we, ne we must bear in mind the points against that have been made, for example, by Anthony Grayling quoting Sam Harris. Um, I think that if I were a parent who really, <coughs> really believed in hell, and thought, <coughs> excuse me, and thought that my children were going to hell, I would indeed be desperately unhappy and desperately anxious to change their minds and might even lock them up the way, the way we've heard these horrible stories. So possibly the answer to that is not just to say how terrible of you to lock your children up, but to say, well, of course if you believe that nonsense about hell, you would lock them up. But it is nonsense. I mean, try to persuade them that their beliefs are stupid. They really are stupid. Mm. To believe that, you're going to, that your soul is going to survive your death is a ridiculously unscientific view, mm. whether it's heaven or hell. Um, so we need to argue against religion itself, not just say, well, um, your, your religion is, 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 fine for, is fine for you as long as you, you know, don't, don't do horrible things because of it. Um, so I, I kind of agree with, with, your, with both positions, that there's, there's a lot to be said for building a coalition, and I've built, a co I've built coalitions with Anglican bishops and people like that on the evolution thing. Um, but nevertheless, what they believe is nonsense, and, yeah. and we need to argue the point. I mean, that's, of course, that's just my opinion, but we need to argue the point, um, not, not, not just cave in and say, oh, well, of course, you're entitled to your opinion. You're entitled to your opinion, but I'm going to argue against it fiercely and vociferously. Mm. And that's what children should do to their parents when they say, well, you're going to hell. No, I'm not going to hell, you're just wrong. Mm. And here's why. Um, as to the question of, um, you know, how can we stand against uh, true bigotry and, and xenophobia against Muslims um, while maintaining a, a strong stance against against some of the harmful aspects of the religion. I mean, I think the first thing would be to 
uh, to recognize that the term Islamophobia is really, it's truly harmful to the debate. It's muddling it up for no good reason. Um, we can call it anti-Muslim bigotry because that is what it is. And I know that I, I wouldn't never, I would never deny that it exists. We all know that it exists and ex-Muslims are often perceived to be Muslims, whether or not we are. People hear our names, people see our families, maybe we're dressed in uh, the clothing from you know back home. And people assume that we're Muslims and they treat us that way. So we know that it exists and it's there and it's incredibly toxic. Um, one thing we can do, which I don't feel that we are doing adequately enough, is to protect the civil liberties of Muslims uh, whenever it calls for it. Um, I've uh, noticed that there has been a tendency in mean, some of the European countries to start banning certain things. Like, I mean, you guys must remember the, the French uh, ban on the, the burkini that was happening, the controversy around this idea that uh, bathing suits that are, that, uh, that, that um, I think they're, they're Islamic bathing suits, that this French town said that we're not going to have it anymore and we're going to ban the use of this dress. Um, I thought that was uh, absolutely ridiculous. Uh, Muslims have a right to to dress up uh, in a wetsuit if that's what they want, uh, if that's how they want, feel comfortable. They have a right to do that. That is uh, a, a right that we all have, and civil liberties have to be applied across the board. This means that if we say that it's okay for us to ridicule religion and we should be allowed to ridicule religion, it is also their right to advocate for their religion and even advocate for views that we might find extremist. We have to allow them uh, that right as well. We have to be able to apply civil liberties um, across the board and evenly in principle. This is incredibly important and if they want to spread extremist speech, then let them air it out, let them talk about it in the public space and let's counter it. Let's, let's create a defense and tackle it head on. You know, I will recognize Islamophobia when they recognize atheo atheophobia, which is a phobia towards atheists. We know around the world, even in the, in the video today, that atheists are butchered, shunned, frauded, and their free speech is violated. The thing is, I really do, I really do believe that no idea is above scrutiny. And, I, and by extension, what that means is no idea is above ridicule. And I'll happily, um, ridicule ideas, but I will stop short when it comes to removing the dignity of somebody. No human being is below dignity. Now when it comes to forging a coalition, I really think that a necessary condition to achieve that is by, by taking into account what binds us all together. Because we know that there is rife tribalism in all pockets of society in order to, and, in order to forge a coalition, you have to highlight and exalt what binds us all together. It could be our common humanity, it could be our progressive worldview. There must be something that binds us all together. Yeah. Um, hello. Um, I'd, I'd, uh, I'd like sorry, to ask. The sorry, um, he was just. Oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry, uh, okay. sorry, sorry. I just wanted to say something. Uh, uh, I'm sure uh, you've heard uh, last year uh, Saudi Arabia passed a law that basically uh, declares any atheist as a terrorist. So uh, yeah. something as simple as a Facebook post can get you the, you know, it's atheophobia. Killed. Atheism yeah. is terrorism. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm, I'm truly shocked. Like, uh, I don't understand why uh, not much more is being done like, from Western activists in the West to basically to it seems too easy, like each country has very normal uh, trades with Saudi Arabia and these countries. It's, it's surprising, well, why is this happening? Uh, why isn't anyone pushing basically to stop uh, all, all those things? Um, in the Middle East, just like, as to give you an insight of activists in the Middle East, the, every regime is trying to pose the, uh, the issue, the question, like when we try to fight for freedoms, they're trying to pose the, uh, the question as, is atheism should, should be legal or not? And even though like, we have an opinion on that answer, of course, atheism should be legal, it's, it's a natural opinion. However, I think it's the wrong question. So basically, um, I'm not sure who said it, but there's this quote that say, uh, says, politicians go to war to avoid the problems of peace. So right now, all Islamic countries, they're really in bad shape, like in development, in rights, in economic conditions, and services, they're really not doing well. Uh, so basically, the, the question is people are angry, and they have to be angry at someone, they have to have a target. So uh, 
a very easy target to shoot. Like it's a duck in a pond. Like, uh, oh, these are atheists, and yes, it's their fault. It's uh, they're against Allah, so on, so on. I think we need to reframe that uh, narrative. As Middle Eastern atheists and secularists, we have to basically um, unite with moderate Muslims, with Christians, with minorities, with atheists, with freethinkers, with everyone, with LGBT communities, and together we have to frame the right questions. How can we ensure rights, freedom of speech, services, economy, electricity, all these things, jobs? And I think in, in that way, uh, there is hope for change in the coming years. Go ahead. Hi. Um, I'd, I'd like to ask the, the, the panel um, for their view on, on one concern that I have, which is this notion of uh, reforming Islam or re uh, Islam reformed. Because as far as, as I see it, this like places the responsibility for progress in the hands of religious people. And to me, that is, I, I don't see that how that parallels what has happened in the West, where essentially, uh, the illustration kicked out religion out of their positions of responsibility in, 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 in policy making, etc. It was not the Vatican that decided to reform itself uh, to become compatible with modern values. They were basically pushed out. And as I see it, this, this notion of reforming Islam is like giving the responsibility for progress to the religious elites. So I, I, I think it's a misleading term. Sorry, we only have four minutes left, so you're sure. okay with the panel taking I, the done, question? Yes. Sorry. Yeah. yeah, I'll talk about... Sorry, was that a question? Uh, excuse Sorry. me. Uh, I just want to add something uh, because my... Hello. Uh, Hi. Uh, I have a question. Ah, sorry, I haven't seen you. Actually, my question is not a question. I just, I'm just trying to react to something since five minutes, and I'll, I'll be very. You need to make it quick. We literally short. have four yeah. minutes. We're so. we're talking about Islamophobia, and I, I uh, and Benjamin uh, spoke about Charlie Hebdo. Actually, I'm a former journalist from Charlie Hebdo, and I'll be one of the speakers tomorrow. And sorry, can to you please slow down? I can't quite hear you. Okay, and I just want to add uh, something for the memory of my colleagues who were killed. Actually, those people were killed because they were treated, uh, described as Islamophobes. Yep. And I just want to um, show the conspiracy against those who criticize Islam. Uh, even Benjamin said, and I, I, I don't blame you for that, actually, because many people believe what you, what you said, that Charlie Hebdo people um, thought that uh, they were, the, um, the liberal left was the enemy. Actually, our editor-in-chief, Shab, he was a member of the Communist Party, and uh, my colleague, Tinews, two minutes before being killed, he was saying around that table that uh, the terrorism is a plop, it comes from unemployment, and we have to give social rights to those people. I mean, Charlie Hebdo was um, a bunch of leftists, really leftist people, but to justify killing them, to justify this hatred against them, they were described like Islamophobes, and that's, uh, I mean, and today, m everyone thinks that they were like far right wing, and I just want to say that among the, the cases, the trials that we had, with the, the religious uh, fundamentalists, either Christian or uh, Muslims, we also had a trial with the far-right uh, wing party, Front National. So uh, please don't fall in that trap. And I totally agree what, with what you said later. Islamophobia is dangerous, it harms, and my colleague were killed because they were described and believed as being Islamophobes. Oh. I have two minutes left. Can I make a very, 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 very quick comment to that? Is that okay? Oh, yes, of course. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Um, what I said in my speech was actually to um, reify the point that they were called Islamophobes and they are very left. Um, I was in contact with your former editor in chief before he was killed. And a lot of the quotes I made today came out of his, his, um, his open letter, which came out a few weeks before he was, he was, he was murdered. Um, so what you said, you know, I completely stands in accord with my own views. Yeah. Yeah, can add as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I just want to say, oh, Zainab, if she's still in the room, like, absolutely, you're my hero, and thank you so much for coming here and for speaking and for sharing your thoughts. Um, but to, to the extent that I can add to that, I think there's a sense of complacency um, that is just so pervasive. Um, you must have 
heard this quote. I used to love this quote uh, back when I was, you know, a little bit younger and religious. That um, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. I used to love this quote because it, it comforted me. It made me think that no matter how horrible things seem today, uh, they will get better. Um, but now I think of this quote as 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 something that. Um, created a sense of, oh, it will happen on its own. But, and it is inevitable, progress is inevitable. But of course, progress is not inevitable. We are not destined to a future where we will have greater liberties or even the liberties that we have today. They require champions who are willing to be in the trenches and are willing to, to fight to make it happen. And that fight is sometimes really ugly. And there's a sense that liberalism and to be left is to be nice. It's, you know, it's this happy hashtag activism type thing. We change our Facebook profiles you know, into the flag of whatever country has been targeted today and we think that we've done something. But that's nothing. Yeah. You know, it requires true uh, fighting to make it happen. It requires people to sacrifice, and Charlie Hebdo and uh, everyone who worked there, they really did make the sacrifice. And we can honor their sacrifice by pushing to make that change ourselves in whatever little ways we can. Okay. And, uh, yes, that's all we have time for on this panel, so please give all of our speakers a massive round of applause. Thank you. Thank you, Victoria, and everybody on the panel. We have um, a lot more discussion after lunch. There's another panel, uh, panel actually, who's going to look at different aspects of religion and fundamentalism in law. We'll come back. Please come back on time. 2.30, I think. Enjoy your lunch. Um, we'll see you soon. Thank you for that. <laughs>